Great. Okay, everybody. So as I said, you're really welcome this morning. Um, my name is Claire Patton and I coordinate the biodiversity themes for green schools. Um, and we're really excited to be celebrating biodiversity week with you and um, with you all. Um, so this week um, is really a nice opportunity for us to celebrate all things um, native Irish biodiversity, all the plants, all of the animals, all the habitats that are around you. And um, all of that lovely stuff. Um, so the the way our week is working at the moment is that we have a live webinar every morning between Monday and Thursday um, at 11 o'clock. Um, and if you missed yesterday's one, you can find the recording um, on the event page. Um, I'll pop that in the chat box um, later on. Um, so all of the um, all the webinars you can watch back if anyone else in the school misses them. And we also have um, activity sheets for each day to help get you outside um, along with an action of the day. So yesterday's action was to get out and do a litter pick. Um, and today's action is to record some kind of biodiversity plant or an animal and maybe submit your findings. So you're going to hear all about that um, in today's webinar. And I mentioned that um, these live events are just Monday to Thursday, so we don't have a live event on Friday because we've got a series of really lovely draw along videos. Uh, so these are available in English and Irish um, and they can help you to draw either a hedgehog, um, a white tailed eagle. Um, and what is our third one? An otter. So you'll you'll hear a bit about that. Um, and like I said, you can listen to the English or the Irish version and there's really lovely um, pictures being drawn along with those. So all that information and activities are on our, our webpage here. Um, so make sure you check that out. And just a tiny bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, so please do keep your microphones um, on mute, but we do want to hear from you. So you can use the chat box to um, ask any questions that you do have. Um, and the, the session is being recorded, but only the video of facilitators is taken. So you can have your camera on or off. You won't be featured um, in the video. So it's just so that other classes that missed out can watch it back. And um, so today's session is on monitoring wildlife. So why it's so important that we know what um, plants and animals we have here and if their numbers are going up and down. Um, so we've got um, our first speaker is going to be um, Karina, who is going to talk about the National Otter Survey. Um, and then hopefully our second speaker is going to be Dave from the Biodiversity Data Centre. Um, he's running a bit late, so uh, fingers crossed Dave makes it. Um, and after that, we will have um, a short Q&A at the end of the webinar. Um, so you can kind of hold on to your questions. So then or you can put them in the chat and we will um, keep a note of them and ask our speakers. And um, so now I'm going to hand over um, to Karina and she's going to have her her video probably turned off and um, but she's going to talk us through this session. So over to you, Karina. Thanks a million, Claire. Hope everyone can hear me. I am in deepest, darkest Mayo, so I'm keeping my video off so that you can hear me clearly and that the video isn't using bandwidth so you can see my my face. I'm going to talk to you today about otters in Ireland and we'll have a little look, a little um, chat first about what otters are, where you find them, and then I'm going to tell you about how we are doing a national otter survey. Right, Claire, you can move on to the next slide. So otters are mammals. They have dark, thick brown fur, which can often look black when they are wet and they're often wet. They belong to the group of mammals called mustelids. So they're related to badgers and stoats. They are found throughout Ireland. So it doesn't matter where you are in the country. It could be Cavan or Limerick or Sligo or Mayo. You'll find otters close to you. And they're always found close to fresh water. So rivers and lakes, but you can find them along the coast too. But if there is fresh water close by, otters are legally protected in Ireland. Um, so it's an offence to hurt or, or injure or shoot them. 
Right, Claire can move on. So just some more otter facts for you. They can stay underwater for four minutes at a time. And that's really important because what they like to do is catch fish, which is their primary food source. But they will also take crustaceans as well. So things like crayfish that you might find in freshwater or crabs that you might find along the coast. They will prey on amphibians too, so frogs and newts and water birds, particularly young birds. So little ducklings, little more hen chicks. They've been recorded taking rabbits on some of our islands. So on the islands off the west coast, but also in islands off Scotland as well, they've also been recorded taking, taking rabbits. But it's quite unusual. Mainly they're what we call piscivores. So they feed mainly on fish. And they do have a preference for salmon and trout fish like that, and eels as well. Right, Claire? So young otters are called cubs, and they're usually born between May and August, but they can be born at any time of year. Generally, the litter size is small, so maybe two or three young is born to each female, and it's just the mum, the females, who look after them. They follow their mother from about four months old. Before that, they spend their time in and around the holt, which is the den where otters live. And by following their mother, they learn how to catch food, so how to catch fish, because it takes a lot of skill, um, even though they're very quick underwater, it takes a lot of skill to learn how to catch a fish. They don't usually become independent from their mum till about 10 months old, so they don't leave their mum um, they don't disperse till they're about 10 months old. A male otter can travel up to 20 kilometers, um, but they'll often use the same routes and they like to use rivers to move along. We, you'll find them along most rivers in Ireland, both small ones and big ones. But they'll always have a sort of medium to large size river within their home range. So that 20 kilometers for the male or the daddy otters is about 20 kilometers. So it's quite a quite quite long. Female otters or the mum otters don't travel as far because she's often looking after young and she can not be too far away from them. She'll need to bring them back food and look after them and make sure they're OK. Because the young don't start swimming until they're about three or four months old. So in, in that time period, when the young are still that small, the mother otter needs to be close by. All right, Claire. As mentioned earlier, otters live close to water. So this picture is an example of the type of river that an otter might use but they'll also use lakeshore habitat as well. So if you've got a lake close by you, there may be otters there. And they'll use the coast too, but there needs to be fresh water close by because they, while they'll fish and catch fish and shore crabs in the sea water, they need to wash the salt off their fur. So they need the fresh water to do that because if they don't, then the fur gets matted and the fur is very important for keeping them warm when they're in fishing in that cold water. Okay, Claire, we can move on. Otters are shy creatures, so they can be hard to see. You may be lucky and you may have, have seen them. Um, and they use whistles and twittering sounds and spitting sounds to communicate with each other. But we don't usually hear these. So it's very important for the young to be able to communicate with their mother to let them know where they are. If you're lucky, you may see them swimming in rivers or lakes or by the coast. Early morning or late in the evening is often the best time for seeing otters, but they can be seen at any time of the day. I've seen them in the middle of the day um, fishing 
along a local river. But they do like quiet areas and areas that maybe aren't disturbed too much by, by humans or dogs. Okay. So while we may not see otters, we can look for signs of otters. What have they left behind them? So we can look for things like footprints, otter springs, which is basically otter poo, and dens, which we call holes. So this here, for example, is a picture of an otter hole, and you can tell it because you can see where the otter has been going in and out. Because often the otters are wet when they're going into the hole, they create what almost looks like a, a sculpted hole. Otters have webbed feet, but this isn't always obvious when you look at their footprints. And um, the, uh, the holes are often found close to river banks or along lake shores. So this is an example of a lake shore where you could po po possibly find some otter prints. If you look, you can look also in places like under bridges. They're often good space places to look as well, particularly if there's mud or sand about. The otter print is about the size of a small dog or a large cat. So six to seven centimeters in diameter. And it's if you look at the picture, you can see that there are five forward pointing toes. And it's really only when the otter print is in soft mud that you'll notice that webbing as well. If we look at the next slide, it just gives you another example of what an otter print looks like and also gives you a little diagram of things to look out for. So an, a nice central pad with a smaller one behind and those five toes pointing forward and the, the nails on the toes, they're not always visible. Um, they are in this picture, but quite often they're not. Um, depends on where the, where the print is. And go to the next slide, Claire. So this is just an example of other uh, footprints that you may find when you're out and about. So you need to be careful because some of them do look a little bit like otters. So if we look at the cat, which is down in the bottom right hand corner, you'll see that there's no sort of nails pointing there and the, the toes are much closer together. Or if you look above that, the mink, that's a much smaller footprint. So it's only four to five centimeters in size. And then if we look across on the left hand side, we have a fox and the one below that is a dog. There are guides you can get. Um, there's free resources on the Wildlife Trust, the Lancashire Wildlife Trust um, website, which shows you where these animal tracks are. All you need to do is put into Google animal tracks, but make sure to put in UK because quite often some of the ones we get are American ones and um, American otters can be different to our otters. And there's also a lovely field studies guide that you can buy as well. And a lot of, if you're close to um, a national park, a lot of those will have some of those field guides available. So it's a great way to get to learn about the different mammals that are using your area is to look for their footprints. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Otter springs, which is basically otter poo, can be found on prominent spots along river banks or along the coast. So if you look for big stones along your river bank, you'll see that there might be poo on top of that. And the give telltale sign that it's otter poo is that if you get a little stick and mess about in the poo, I know it sounds a bit disgusting, but it's the best way and only way to do it. You could find little fish bones in there or the scales of fish, um, which are round and sort of see-through. Um, the otters like to leave the springs here to show other otters that they've been there. So it's a sort of I was here message for them. So it's important for males and females um, to know if there's anyone about. And otters tend to be territorial as well. So they don't like other males coming into their territory. 
So they'll always leave a sign behind them. And the otter syringe is, is one of the best ones. So when we're doing the otter surveys, we have to do it during dry weather, because you can imagine if we have a lot of rainfall, these otter springs get washed away. So it's important that we have a couple of weeks of dry weather before we carry out um, an otter survey. All right, Claire, go on to the next slide. So to tell you a little bit more about the National Otter Survey um, and why we need to do it. So the otter is listed as a near threatened species throughout Europe. So back in the 50s and 60s and 70s, otter numbers really fell dramatically throughout most of Europe. And a lot of this was because of water pollution and the loss of habitat. Here in Ireland, we think our otter population was always pretty good, um, but it's still very important that we monitor the population regularly to make sure that the numbers are stable so that we want to make sure that the otters are, population is healthy and safe and that it isn't being impacted by maybe things like pollution or into the future things like climate change. Otters can be threatened by a number of different things. Water is particularly important that there isn't a water pollution. It may not impact the otters directly, but what it does affect is the otters um, prey. So the otters feed mainly on fish and freshwater invertebrates, things that live in the water. So if the fish are killed by a pollution incident, there's no food available for the otter. Otters can also be impacted if the vegetation, so the trees and the cover along the bank side or along the lakeshore is taken away because they need that cover so that they can safely move from area to area looking for food as they go. Otters can also be impacted by accidental death. So sometimes they can get killed on our roads or they may get caught in snares. So there's lots of things that can impact our otter population. So it's very important for us to monitor, to make sure the otters are safe. All right, Claire, go to the next one. So the National Otter Survey has been taking place for the last couple of years. And prior to that, it happened 10 years ago. And the National Parks and Wildlife Service staff are going out and they're surveying randomly selected squares throughout the whole of Ireland. And if you look at the map here on the right hand side of your screen, all those purple squares shows you where otters have been recorded. And this information is held on the National Biodiversity Data Centre website. So when the National Parks and Wildlife Service staff are surveying for otters, they go out to a, a bridge along a river and they walk a 500 meter section of that river bank from the bridge either up or downstream and they look for signs of otter presence so like i was saying seeing an otter is quite unusual but we can look for the prints and we can look for the springs we can look for holes and if a ranger is really lucky they might actually see an otter as well and similarly, along the coast, a 500 meter stretch of coast is examined by the rangers. So they walk along there and they're looking all the time for signs of otters. But as I was saying earlier, they have to wait for dry weather. So we need two weeks of dry before we can go out because even things like the footprints can get washed away if the rain falls on them. So while it's hard to see actual otters, it's relatively easy to see the signs. So there are ways that you can get involved with the National Otter Survey as well. And this is what we call citizen science. So it's something that everyone can get involved with. So if you have or you live close to a stretch of, of river or a lake, go out with an adult and see if you can spot any of the evidence that I have mentioned. So you can look for otter prints, you can look for springs, you can look for holts. And if you're not sure of what you found, 
happened, you can always take a photograph and send it in um, to either the National Biodiversity Centre or you could send it um, in to me as well. Any evidence of otters can be reported to the National Biodiversity Data Centre. Right, Claire, you can move now. Thank you. So if you go to biodiversityireland.ie and you look on their surveys page, you'll see a section about submitting otter records. Otter records. Um, there's also a little video as well. So you can, if after this talk you feel inspired and you would like to go and survey some otters, you can watch that video and that will show you more examples of all the things that I have been speaking about. So when you want to submit your auto records, you cl click on that submit your records here button and that will bring you then to um, the next slide. Which is the National Biodiversity Data Centre web page and on this um, mapping system, you can record all types of mammals and birds and um, dragonflies, which Dave's going to speak to you after. All you have to do is put in your name, what date it was, the nearest village, and the map on the right hand side that allows you to zoom in and pinpoint the exact location where you found it. And then you put in your observation details as well. So, you know, what did you see? An otter, what kind of observation type was it? So there's a drop down menu there and you can, you might have been really lucky. You might have seen an actual otter. But you can click on you see so prints whatever it is and then you can also upload a picture so if you're not 100 percent that it was an uh, otter print always make sure to in, attach a photo as well so that's just a whistle top tour about otters and i would like to thank everyone for listening and i hope you enjoyed the talk and hopefully you learned something about otters and you'll feel inspired to go out and record um some of the wildlife that you're seeing in in your area there's um i think as claire mentioned today one of your actions is to record something doesn't have to be an otter. It could be you could go out into your play area. You could find a daisy or a buttercup and you can record those just um, that record is just as valuable as as any other record. And Dave will speak more to you about the importance of, of recording. Thanks a million, everyone, for listening. Thanks, Karina. That was great and um, really interesting to hear and see all the lovely pictures of otter prints and poo and everything like that. Um, so that was fab. And um, so I'm going to hand over um, to, to Dave now. Um, so hopefully you can share your screen there, Dave, and I'm going to spotlight you. Okie dokie. <clears throat> I will share my screen. It's just reminding me one of the first jobs I had when I left university was surveying otters around West Cork. And uh, yeah, it was quite enjoyable. OK, can everyone see that? Yeah, we can see it. Right. <clears throat> so from otters to another species that's found um, mainly in freshwater habitats, but also around the coast, a bit like otters. And that is dragonflies and damselflies. And I'm here to talk to you today about the Dragonfly Ireland Survey. This isn't the first Dragonfly Ireland Survey we have done um, way, 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 way back. Um, probably before many of you, indeed all of you, were born. Uh, in the early noughties, um, there was the first Dragonfly Ireland Survey. That was conducted by this motley bunch of um, both experts and amateur naturalists, if you like, who went out and surveyed right around Ireland. Um, they split Ireland up into a kind of grid square of imaginary 10 kilometer square grids, and they tried to hit as many of those 10 kilometer square um, grids as possible. And at the end of that, then they found out the distributions for the various dragonfly and damselfly species, and they produced pretty maps like the one you see on the right-hand side of the screen there. 
So that was the first Dragonfly Ireland survey, which is fantastic because it gives us a baseline. It gives us a starting point from which to compare how things have changed to today. So 20 years later, we're doing the same thing again. Um, we've teamed up with our colleagues in CEDAR, which is the Centre for Environmental Data and Recording in Northern Ireland. And we're blitzing the country again and trying to find out the distribution of all of our dragonfly and damselfly species. To do this, we're using citizen science. So what is citizen science? I'm sure you've heard about it, but what does it all mean? Well, citizen science really is people like you, like me. You can be an expert. You can not be an expert doing science, creating new knowledge by going out and doing a survey or submitting information in some other way. The idea behind citizen science is that everyone benefits. The experts maybe who designed the project benefit, the public benefits, um, science benefits. So everyone's a winner at the end of the day. The idea is also that people who participate in citizen science should receive feedback on it. So you don't just do a citizen science project and hear nothing back. So you give all your data and you hear nada. You should be hearing back from the people running the project about how things are going, what's happening, uh, where things have been found, where they haven't been found, etc. And finally, um, the data, the information that's produced should be open, should be freely accessible. That's a, a big um, driver behind citizen science is that we're creating data, we're creating information that's freely available to anyone and everyone who uses it or who wants to use it. If you are interested in citizen science and finding out more, you can go to the European Citizen Science Association website and read more about the principles behind citizen science. On a practical level then, when we're trying to do citizen science, if you like, um, what are the pluses and minuses? Well, definitely for where citizen science is involved, what we find is the more you ask someone to do, the less likely they are to do it. So if you ask someone to go out and do some highly complicated survey involving lots of gadgetry and, give, and methods, and it's going to take you five hours, well, not many people are going to sign up to that. And why should they? It's people contributing their own um, free time. So conversely, the things that work best in citizen science is when you ask people to go out and do one small thing or one thing that doesn't take up too much time and that is fairly easy to do. What are the benefits of citizen science? Well, one of the big benefits is that if I was to, for example, pay a whole load of researchers go out and survey every dragonfly and dra damselfly species in every 10 kilometer square in Ireland, it will cost an absolute fortune because it's a lot of work, a lot of ground to cover, a lot of time involved. And to be honest with you, we'd probably not get the funding to do that. However, by funding citizen science, what we can do is ask volunteers to go out and do their own little bit, spend an hour, maybe, or half an hour just out surveying their own local freshwater habitat, record whatever dragflies, stamps of fly species they find, and then we gather up all that data together and it forms a large data set from which we can begin to figure out what's going on in terms of dragonfly and damselfly distributions. The other bonus of citizen science is that if I do a project like Dragonfly Ireland and I have to pay for it, well, I'd be lucky to get two or three years funding. So it's going to be a short term uh, survey. Whereas if you do surveys through citizen science, because they're cheaper to run, you can pretty much keep those going ad infinitum. So on and on and on and on through the years. Um, what you'll find is a lot of the long term biodiversity data sets, um, such as the bird surveys, such as bat surveys, um, such as marine mammal surveys that are done in Ireland are citizen science, largely citizen science generated because it's cheaper to do it that way. So for Dragonfly Ireland, 
the second version of Dragonfly Ireland, what do we want to do? Well, we want to prepare updated maps of Dragonfly and Damselfly distributions. So we see what has changed in terms of where Dragonflies and Damselflies can be found around Ireland. We also want to know, because we're funded by the Environmental Protection Agency, we want to know what do dragonflies or what can dragonflies and damselflies tell us about climate change and what's happening there and water quality around the country. And we also want people to start thinking a bit more about freshwater habitats. You know, we see our local river and stream or pond or lake, uh, but how much time do we actually spend about think considering what species occur there, um, what the water quality might be like, what impact we're having on our local freshwater habitats. And so we set up Dragon Fire and our home on the interweb is by, at biodiversityireland.ie. Scroll down the page, click on the picture of a, dra of a dragonfly and uh, you're into the website, which will tell you all about the project and how to get involved. So the survey I'm really here to talk to you about today is Dragonfly Spotter. Dragonfly Spotter is really our, our baseline survey for people who are out and about in the countryside doing what, or indeed the city, doing whatever they're doing, walking the dog, um, rowing down the river, whatever you're doing, yoga by the lakeside. And you spot a dragonfly or a damselfly, you want to record it. Well, Dragonfly Spotter is the place to go. You click on the Dragonfly Spotter link and it enables you to submit um, your record along with a photo if you can get it. Or if you can't get it, hopefully you'll be able to describe what you saw to enable us um, confirm what species it was. You can do this on the web form through Biodiversity Ireland or on our app. If you happen to have the app on hand. Where to look then for dragonflies and damselflies? Where am I going to find these things? Well, you're going to find them in rivers and streams, certainly. Not a huge number of species, but, are, you know, you'll see them very regularly in those kind of habitats. Lakes are a big one. Ponds are a big one. Dragonflies and damselflies love lakes and ponds, especially open banked lakes, ones that aren't covered in trees, that have nice grassy, um, sunny uh, lakeside habitats. You'll also find them along the canals. So, for example, the canals running through Dublin or Kildare around the rest of the country, you'll find certainly a good mix of dragonflies and damselflies there. And also, if you le live next or near to a bog, um, bogs are good habitats too. But we have to remember that we're dealing with freshwater habitats. So there are do's and don'ts. Uh, the do's are definitely you need to stay safe. Freshwater, any form of freshwater can be dangerous. So preferably bring an adult with you if you're going out searching for dragonflies and damselflies. Stay dry. There's absolutely no need to get yourself wet or have your toes touch the water during these surveys. You'll be able to find dragonflies and damselflies just by walking along the, the river or lake bank. Um, so there's no need to go that close to the water. And the good news is that these surveys have to be done on sunny days. So don't bother going out when it's raining. Just go out when it's sun is splitting the stones, the skies are clear, and preferably the winds aren't too strong. That is the perfect conditions to find dragonflies and damselflies. The don'ts are, as I said, don't go near the water's edge. Uh, you can stay back a meter or two and still quite successfully find dragonflies and damselflies. Preferably... In fact, absolutely don't go out alone. Go out, uh, preferably with an adult. Don't bother trying to catch them. Number one, you'll make an absolute fool of yourself because they're really hard to catch. Um, and they're also, you know, if you want to take pictures of them, the best technique is just to watch them, wait till they land, and then try and sneak up close enough to take a photo of them at that stage. So... What is the story so far? We've started the survey in 2019. This is the kind of last year of the, the main survey, although we will be asking people to continue doing um, surveys at their own localities uh, or their own local lakes or ponds uh, between now and the next big survey. Um, this is what's happened. So you can see that the green bars here are the background level of records of dragonflies and damselflies. And you can see it's generally at a fairly low level, a thousand records a year-ish. 
And then you kick in some money for Dragonfly Ireland and some effort and you promote the project and the number of records surges up and we get thousands and thousands of records. Well, Dragonfly Ireland 2 is pretty much the same picture. Once we started promoting the surveys and putting effort into asking people to go out and record, we got a big surge in numbers and that surge has stuck with us throughout the project. And we're hoping to see uh, an equally um, wonderfully abundant number of uh, records coming in this year. And this is how we're doing in terms of distribution. So like I say, we invent this imaginary grid of 10 kilometer grids, uh, square grids right across Ireland so we can see where we're going and what we're targeting. Um, we've pretty much hit about 85% of the 1,000 or so 10 kilometer grid squares that are there to be surveyed. So we're focused very much this year on trying to fill in as many of those blanks as possible. So if you see a blank on that screen and you live next to it or near it, then maybe you can help us fill in one of the last remaining blanks on our map. Uh, more information on that is available on the uh, Dragonfly Iron website. In terms of species, then, what we tend to see is we tend to see the same species filling the top five, six slots uh, year on year. They'll change a little bit. One year, blue tailed damselfly will be the top species. Next year, common blue damselfly will be the top species. Next year, will be large red damselfly. But generally, it's the same few species at the top. And then you get down into lower and lower number of species. There are the odd, odd, oddities. We have species that appear to be in decline, species that appear to be on the up and up, and I'll talk about those in a few minutes. This is what it looks like in terms of the number of records we receive from people. So this is a typical um, record bar chart for scissors and science projects. We get loads and loads and loads of records from people who submit one record or two records and then disappear off the face of the earth, never to be seen again. Um, we never hear from them again. They've just done it once. That's it. Their job's done. They don't submit any more records. And then we've smaller numbers of people who submit larger numbers of records and some people who submit hundreds of records every year. But you could be one of those people who submits what is the bulk of the data in terms of single records or a handful of records. So even though you might only submit one or two records, you still make a really important contribution to our understanding of dragonflies and damselflies. What are we finding in terms of what the information, the data, the records are showing us? Well, one of the things we're looking at are the impacts of climate change. We have this handsome looking species here, which is the emperor dragonfly. The emperor dragonfly is one of our biggest dragonfly species. It's about not quite the length of your hand, but maybe the length of the the length of your fingers there on an adult's hand. So quite a big dragonfly. Its distribution runs from its distribution runs from Cape Town in South Africa all the way up to Finland, which is quite the scope for any species distribution to have. In Europe, Ireland represents the northwestward most edge of its distribution. It can't really go any further more northwest because there's a sea between us and kind of the Faroe Islands and Iceland and Greenland and places like that. So we're probably as far as northwest as it's going to go in Europe. But it was a very different story 20 years ago when the first Dragonfly Iron Survey was conducted. At that time, Drag uh, emperor dragonflies weren't really part of the Irish fauna. They weren't considered a native species. In fact, it was during that first dragonfly iron survey that they, we started picking up records of emperor dragonfly. And at that stage, we were only picking them up right along the south coast and the southeast coast. They were just arriving in in ones and twos from probably from the continent, from uh, France, um, being blown across the sea and uh, winding up on our shores. But in the intervening 20 years, they have spread right across Ireland, right the way uh, northwestward up to Donegal. And it was only in the last couple of years that we started picking up records of Emperor Dragonfly in Sligo, Donegal, um, places like that. So in 20 years, they spread across the whole of Ireland. 
Why have they done that? Well, we think it's down to global warming. It, this map on the right hand side of the screen is the mean annual sunshine in hours um, prepared by the Met Office. So you can see that the warmest spots in Ireland are on the east and southeast coast and the coolest areas are on the northwest coast. So as temperatures rise uh, over the years, what's happening is those cooler areas as you travel northwest are becoming more suitable to um where the emperor dragonfly likes to live and pretty much at this stage now it can survive right across the island of ireland and that's just one impact uh, that we can see on the ground of global warming another one is that we see a change in how dragonflies and damselflies uh, react to water temperature so the dragonflies and damselflies we see buzzing around in the air at this time of the year, they're only really the end stage of the lives of these animals. They spend most of their lives in the water, in freshwater habitats, as nymphs. And they might live for anywhere between one and five years as nymphs, squirreling away on the bottom of rivers and lakes, eating stuff and living in the mud. And it's only their adult stage, their last hurrah, where they emerge, they uh, transform from a nymph into an adult that can fly. They fly around maybe for a month or two at most, and then they die. And then the nymphs carry on the, the next generation in the water. What we're seeing, though, is that the flight period, the period at which we see these adults emerging, has shifted earlier in the year for a lot of species, particularly for damselfly species. So on this chart, you can see the blue line is the flight period of larger damselfly back in during the first dragonfly iron survey in 2000, 2003. And the orange line is the one we're finding now. It's pretty much the same line, but it's all shifted earlier in the year by about two weeks. So we think that as well is a reaction to climate change. What we're finding is that they, our springs are arriving earlier, although you wouldn't think it this year with all the rain, but uh, things are warming up that bit earlier in the year, which is enabling these uh, animals emerge as adults that little bit earlier year on year. What then makes a good home for dragonflies and damselflies? If we're thinking about habitats, well, uh, lakes and ponds are definitely their favourite habitats. You get the, the greatest richness of species in lakes and ponds. If you're looking at a lake and pond, what makes it good for dragonflies? Good water quality. They don't like nutrient enrichment. They basically don't like poo, whether it's human poo or animal poo. They don't like enriched water. So nice, clean water, clear water with low nutrient levels. They like open areas of banks. They don't like to be overcrowded by um, trees because the adults like to sunbathe a lot. They also like nice vegetation on top of the water. And the nymphs themselves, we don't think about them much, but when they're down in the lakes, they don't like to be covered over either. They like some sunlight getting through to them too to help them grow. And they like ponds with shallow margins because the, that's the kind of depth of which the, the nymphs, the, the, the young uh, dragonflies do best. They like emergent vegetation, so plants that stick up out of the water so they can crawl up the stalks of those plants when they're emerging as adults. They don't like invasive species necessarily because they don't really recognize them as habitat. New plants that might fill a pond may not be suitable for our native dragonfly and damselfly fauna. And they don't like fish because fish eat them. So that's bad news if you're a dragonfly or damselfly nymph. And things like human disturbance as well can have an impact. So what can you do in terms of contributing to the Dragonfly Iron Survey? You can head out there if you're out beside a lake or a pond or a canal or a river or a stream or you're taking a walk along the bog um, with your parents and you see a dragonfly or a damselfly, by all means, have a bit of fun. Try and get a photo of it. Like I say, the trick is to wait for it to land Stalk up it as quietly as you can. It actually does help if you crouch, but you'll look a bit mad doing it. Uh, take a fit picture with your smartphone camera or uh, a digital camera if you have one, and then submit that record to us at the National Biodiversity Data Center, and we will validate that record and it'll form part of the survey database then, which we'll use to interpret what's going on in terms of um, 
climate change and water quality and their impacts on dragonflies and damselflies. To help with this, we have resources um, online. We have a swatch, which is available through our, our shop. Um, but also on the website, you can download digital versions of our posters, which will give you um, a, a good guide to most of the common dragonfly and damselfly species you're likely to encounter. Overall, we've 33 species that have ever been recorded in Ireland. Um, we've about 29 species during the period of this survey. So it's a relatively small number of species and they are... Um, reasonably easy to identify but again if you're not sure make your best stab at it we validate the records anyway so um all is good there so go online to biodiversityireland.ie and find out more at uh by clicking on the dragonfly ireland link thank you very much <clears throat> that's great dave thanks a million for that um really interesting stuff and um, especially about how it's linked to uh the climate change um very fascinating and um, so much we can learn from this it's not just what, what numbers are there but how it's affecting the rest of or the rest of the country and um, so we've got a good few questions already in the chat and um, but if, it, if people already or people have more questions you can put them in now either for dave or karina um, and i will uh try and ask time to take turns asking and um, so I'm going to start off with one for you, Dave. So this has come from Frankie in Clooney National School. And Frankie asks, do dragonflies sting? Hey, Frankie. No, the answer is they don't sting. There's all sorts of old um, folk tales and things like that about dragonflies and dragonflies. One of the common names for them used to be the devil's darning needles. And you're... If you lived in Ireland a certain number of years ago, your granny might have said, don't go near that river or the devil's darning needles will get you. And I suspect it was less to do with um, fear of dragonflies and more to do with trying to scare kids away from rivers and lakes uh, where they knew parents would know uh, it was a danger to be. So they'd say the dragonflies could get you. They don't. And to be honest with you, even the largest dragonfly that we have in Ireland can't do anything to you. They might sit in your finger and don't get me wrong, they might try and have a chew on your finger, but their mouth parts aren't strong enough to break through our skin. So they're completely harmless. Brilliant. Thanks, Dave. Um, so question for you here, Karina. So from St. Luke's um, Tyrrellstown Four class. Don't know, this is a hard one now. I'm not sure we do have an answer, but um, they would like to know how many otters are there in Ireland and how many different types of otters are there? OK, hello, fourth class. So we know from the last survey, which was carried out 10 years ago, that there are um, approximately 12,000 um, otters in Ireland. Um, so we're hoping or at the moment looking at the otter returns we've had so far, it's looking at approximately the same um, about 10 years ago. And there's only one otter species. So all we have here is what we call the Eurasian otter or the European otter. Um, its Latin name is Luthera Luthera. Um, we only have that one otter in Ireland. If you go to America, they have a sea otter and they have a freshwater otter, but they're not the same as ours. Brilliant. Thanks, Karina. Um, but one for you, Dave. So Paul um, in um, Coot Hill in Cavan are, wants to know, would you only find dragonflies in areas with water? So do they move far from the water they've come from as an imp? You mostly find them in areas with water, but dragonflies especially, because they're bigger and kind of beefier than damselflies, are well capable of traveling long distances. So you will find them in woodlands, you'll find them over meadows, um, especially if you have any wildflower meadows near where you are, they'll find them uh, there. You'll find them in back gardens. My mother in Dublin, in Terenure in Dublin, I don't know where the nearest lake is, miles away, but she has brown hawkers in her back garden every year. Um, I've no idea where they're coming from, but that's where they end up. Uh, they obviously like the feeding opportunities in the back gardens. Um, and indeed, there's some species that are migratory. Um, for example, the migrant hawker, who used to make its way over from France and the continent every year. And some of the species that arrive here come from the Middle East and Far East. Um, they're more unusual and they're helped by the wind, but certainly they're capable of traveling fairly long distances. Very cool. Yeah, I actually put a mini pond into my mum's back garden during COVID 
and she's had dragonflies arrive since, so they, they definitely move around. Um, another one for you, Karina. Um, so um, from Clooney National School, what is an otter's home called and what is it made from? Okay, so hello, Clooney. So otters live in what we call otter holes. And these are holes that they dig into maybe the side of a river bank, or sometimes they may use a, a, a hole that's already there, maybe dug by a, a fox. Um, they will also go in under the roots of trees. They also have things called couches, and these are areas where they'll stay for shorter periods of time. So they might lie up on a couch um, during the day, um, just to sort of hide away. And this can be just an area uh, with thick cover, maybe bracken or in under some trees. Um, but generally it's an otter holt. That's where they, they spend most of their time. Well, thanks, Karina. So we've got loads of questions here coming in. Um, here's a good one, Dave. What is the difference between a dragonfly and a damselfly? Okay. Um, I mean, they're all part of the kind of same family. Um, they're both a very ancient species. In fact, the, the first dragonfly like animals evolved about 400 million years ago, much earlier than the dinosaurs. And for your information, the biggest one that ever grew grew to about two foot wide. But the difference, the main difference that we can see uh, between damselflies and dragonflies, dragonflies tend to be bigger, bigger, stockier. And their eyes, especially if you look at the eyes in their head, they're close together, like a fly's eyes. They're stuck together, almost touching on, the, on their head. If you look at a damselfly, they tend to be thinner, um, much uh, more delicate and smaller. And their eyes are out in stalks either side of their head, a bit like a hammerhead shark, except not like a hammerhead shark. But their eyes are out in stalks either side of their head. So that's one good difference uh, you can use to tell them apart. Very cool. You have to get your your uh, close ups for that, maybe. Um, so, Karina, I'll ask you two at once here. They're a little bit linked. So one question is, would an otter eat a dragonfly? And then from um, this Mac and National School, are otters aggressive? OK, so I think an otter would have a hard time catching a dragonfly because they're pretty good aerial flyers and they're pretty fast. Now, otters are opportunistic, which means that if they come across something they can eat, they will eat it. Um, I'm not 100 percent sure, but I'm pretty sure. So as Dave's already said, otters, uh, otters, dragonflies spend a lot of time in the water as nymphs. And these nymphs, if an otter was hungry, I'm pretty sure, and if it was fast enough, it would catch them. Now, the nymphs are a little bit aggressive and they've got sharp pincers. They might give an otter a, a, a sore nose. Dave could correct me on this one. Um, so, yes, they might catch the nymphs, but I think a flying dragonfly, they'll have trouble, um, trouble catching. Whether otters are aggressive or not, no, not really. I mean... And certainly not towards humans, because if they see a human coming, they're going to disappear pretty quickly. Um, they're shy creatures. They don't want to interact with us really at all. So they're going to they're going to run. They're not going to stay and fight. Um, they might be a little bit aggressive with each other because they have their territories. So they'll want to stay. They'll want to keep their territories to themselves and they won't want other otters coming into them. But generally, no. Hope that helps and answers the question. Real, thanks, Mel Karina. Um, here's an interesting one, Dave. Can this is from our Cormac National School for class? Can dragonflies be seen in the dark? And do they glow? <laughs> do they glow? It's a good question. I'm not sure. I know it's looked. Generally, you don't see them in the dark. Um, in fact, almost positively, you won't see them in the dark. The reason for that is they're. Um, they rely on the sunlight for their energy, uh, so they're cold-blooded. They need sunlight to warm up, to warm up their muscles, their flight muscles, so that they can take flight. You'll find that even on cloudy days, if a cloud, you know, you can have a beautiful sunny day and then a big black cloud passes over and blocks out the sun for a few minutes. All the dragonflies and damselflies, within a few minutes, will just settle down and stop flying because they're not getting enough heat. 
Um, and then when the cloud passes, up oh, they come again and they're buzzing all over the place. They really are, their activity levels are strongly linked to how much sunshine is about and how warm the temperatures are. So likelihood of seeing them in the middle of the night, very unlikely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, probably don't want to go out in the dark doing dragonfly surveys for lots of reasons as well, if you're going near the water. Um, one for you, Karina. Um, what kind of fur do, do otters have? So otters have really thick fur, and the reason they need that thick fur is because they're doing all their hunting in, not all, but the majority of their hunting in water, and water can be quite cold, especially in the winter. So they have really thick fur, um, which they groom regularly to keep it in really good condition. Um, and that's again why I mentioned as well, if they're going into the sea and getting covered in seawater, they'll always need a freshwater supply nearby where they can go and they can wash that fur and groom it. Um, so they need that thick fur and it's it's dark brown in color, but when it's, it's, it's wet, it can look black. And um, a few rapid fire here for you, Dave. So from Rongatree and Gale School Nasnaree, why are they named dragonflies? Can you tell the difference between a male and a female? And what do they eat? Now, why are they named dragonflies? Probably just their size. I mean, they're, they're the biggest insects, certainly flying insects we have in Ireland. Um, they're quite impressive. Uh, you know, some of these big dragonfly species would give you a scare. So that's probably why they got the common name of dragonflies. Um, what do they eat? They eat anything they can fit in their dragonfly mouths. So they're excellent hunters. They have a 95% success rate in hunting, which is the highest success rate of any species that we know of because they're excellent aerial maneuvers. Um, they'll eat midges, butterflies, other dragonflies and damselflies. You name it. If they can catch it, they'll eat it. And what was the middle question? Uh, can you tell the difference between a male and a female? You can. They're a bit like birds in a way, in that the males tend to be brighter and more striking in their coloration and uh, mostly all of the same kind of color. And the females tend to be a bit more varied and slightly duller colors. So when we're telling people to go out and survey, we always say, look at towards the edge of rivers and ponds and lakes, because that's where the males hang out and they're easier to identify. Brilliant. Thanks, Dave. So we've gone way over time, guys. So we might just finish with one final question. So we'll give that to Mikey in third class school water day in Limerick. Um, and he's asking about dragonflies, but I might ask the same question to you both. So what county has the most dragonflies, if you know, Dave, or maybe you could just answer that for one in particular. And same for you, Karina. Do you know what, what county has the most otters? So for dragonflies, basically the southeast does best because it's the sunniest and the northwest does does worse because it's it gets less sunshine. So probably Waterford, Wexford, that kind of area. Any idea, Karina, what the um, county with the most otters are? I'm afraid I don't know, but um, I will. I'll I'll look up and see if I can find an answer to that question in in the last survey. But um, hopefully for the new survey, we'll we'll have we'll have. They are very widespread. You know, any county that's got plenty of rivers, you're going to have otters. Um, so I'm not sure if there is an answer to that question, but we can we can have a we can certainly have a look and see. We'll watch this space for when the, the results of this survey come out. And um, well, guys, we'll, we'll, we'll finish up there. Um, so many brilliant questions. Thanks so much to everybody um, who asked um, and for, for listening. We really appreciate it. Hopefully you can all um, get out and do your best at trying to record um, some biodiversity today. It might not be an otter or a dragonfly, but see what you can find. Um, and thanks a million as well to Dave and to Karina. Um, really, really interesting stuff. Um, so much knowledge there. So it was really fascinating. Um, so thanks, everybody. And I hope you enjoy the rest of Biodiversity Week. And hopefully we'll see you at another webinar. Um, so enjoy the rest of the day and the rest of the week. Bye, guys. Bye. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, everyone. Bye.